Hi everybody, welcome to our next lecture on the ideas of planetary motion and gravitation. And today we're going to look at a couple of things involving well, launching rockets, satellites, probes, things like that into space. Whether they're a satellite that's going to orbit the Earth or something that's going much further into space. Um, and to start off we're going to talk about something called the escape velocity. Escape velocity is essentially the lowest possible speed you need in order to escape the gravitational pull of an object. Okay, so for example, whether or not we are sending a satellite in orbit or sending out a deep space probe or something like that, uh, whatever that is, object we're sending out, needs to get to a certain velocity just to break away. In other words, once they reach that, that velocity, if the engine shut off, they will escape. They will be able to leave our gravitational pull enough where they won't come crashing back to the ground. But what's interesting is that the mass of the object itself doesn't really matter. In other words, escape velocity is a very set value. Nor does it matter where that object is going. It's one value based on the object itself that you're leaving from, whether it's the Earth or whether you're trying to slingshot around the Sun. You need to make sure that you get to this certain speed in order to escape. Now why? Well, interestingly enough, Isaac Newton actually first proposed the idea of what it would take to get something to orbit the Earth, okay, to actually go up and orbit or escape gravity. And his plan was, take a cannon to the highest mountain you can find and point it horizontally. And now, if we shoot our cannon, well, we already know from projectile motion that when we launch a horizontal launch, it will go out and immediately begin to fall towards the Earth. However, if we give it a higher initial velocity, it travels a longer horizontal distance before falling to the ground. And so Isaac Newton said if you keep launching at a higher and higher speed, that it will go farther and farther before crashing to the ground. It might even make it halfway around. Until you reach a speed that is high enough that as it falls back to the Earth, it literally continues to miss. In other words, because the Earth is curved, it's always falling and yet it's continually missing. So whatever that minimum velocity is, once you reach that, you'll never crash back to your planet or your star or anything like that. Um, in case you're curious, the escape velocity for the Earth, if we were to shoot something right from the ground, in other words, if we were to take our cannon and point it straight up in the air and fire it, is actually about 11,000 meters per second, okay? Or around 25,000 miles an hour. Now, we don't really need to do that. For, uh, for example, when we launch a rocket, uh, it has continual engines, so it's always forcing up and up and up and up. Um, so for example, you only need to reach eventually about a speed of about 17,000 miles an hour um, to send something into orbit. And that's because, really, by the time the engine shut off, it's much higher up. And it turns out distance also affects what your escape velocity is. In other words, we would need about 25,000 miles an hour if we shot something directly from the Earth, one blast and that's it. But once you get farther away, your escape velocity becomes less and less. Now, once we have escaped, and in this case, for example, like a satellite or something like that, it can then settle into a particular orbit. But interestingly enough, when it settles into a specific location, it will have a very specific orbital velocity. And any object that is at that same distance from the planet will actually maintain the exact same orbital velocity. So objects of the same height have that same orbital speed. That's one of the reasons we can actually park satellites in the same orbit, because they will always chase each other but they'll maintain the same constant velocity. They'll never really catch each other. And it turns out the orbital velocity has nothing to do with the actual mass of the object that is orbiting. Okay? But it, what it does have to do with is what is your distance. Okay? What is your distance from the center of the planet or how high above the planet are you really going to be? Well, how do we get that orbital velocity? Well, imagine a satellite in orbit around the Earth. Okay? creating a nearly circular orbit. Well, if it's in circular motion, we know there must be some sort of force acting towards the center of the circle. Now, we know now that force is the force of gravity. 
But if it's acting towards the center of the circle, we can consider it a centripetal force. Well, let's take a look at that. If these two forces are equal, well, they each have formulas, so I can substitute in formulas. The gravitational force one, we've learned to be g, m1, m2 over r squared. Centripetal force, we'll take the mv squared over r relationship. Okay. Now, notice we've got some things that look similar there that we could do a little canceling. Well, I can get rid of r here and that squared part here. And I can get rid of a mass. Now, which mass do you think I'm getting rid of, the satellite or the planet? Well, we've just established that the satellite's mass can never matter, and it's got to be the satellite's mass because it's the one that is in motion, the one with the velocity. So now I've got this g, m over r, and if I take the square root of both sides, I end up with this interesting relationship, the square root of g, m over r. And that is the equation for orbital velocity, anything in orbit. Now because of that equation, because r is in the denominator, what that means is larger distances yield slower natural orbits. So let's look at an example here. We've got a satellite that is in orbit 800 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And we want to know what its orbital velocity would be. Now notice I didn't give you the mass of the satellite because it doesn't matter what it is. The orbital velocity equation says that my velocity in orbit is the square root of g m over r. Now, first of all, we've got to be very careful about that r. Remember, r is actually center to center. So if we're going to consider what r is, it's the radius of the Earth, 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters, plus that 800 kilometers, which is actually 800,000 meters, or 8 times 10 to the fifth meters. So that means that r is actually 7.18 times 10 to the sixth meters. That's going to be my r value. So now to get my velocity, I have the square root g, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, the universal gravitational constant. The mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th all over r, which we've now established is 7.18 times 10 to the 6th, which gives me an orbital velocity of 7,453 meters per second. Pretty fast, right? And it needs to be going pretty fast so that it doesn't come crashing back to the Earth. Because it turns out that speed is very important to maintaining its orbit. Now, let's look at sort of a simulated example here. Uh, here we have the, I think it's the International Space Station orbiting around the Earth here. Um, and as you can see, it maintains a very steady, constant orbit based on that distance. Now, if we were to slow the satellite down somehow, whoops, oh, it came crashing back to Earth. So maintaining that distance is very important in order to maintain your actual orbit. If my satellite is moved farther away, however, now it can travel at a much slower distance in order to maintain that orbit. Okay, it doesn't have to go as fast because it is simply farther away it will maintain that orbit based on that larger distance even though it travels at a slower velocity. So things that are out at a much greater distance will orbit at much slower speeds. Which brings up an interesting location you may have heard of. Something called geosynchronous orbit. Well the word geo meaning Earth and synchronized means at the same time. So a satellite that is in geosynchronous orbit orbits with the Earth. In other words, it maintains its same place over the planet at all times. Okay, so that means it's going to turn with the planet. So, for example, um, something like DirecTV or Dish Network, their satellites need to be in geosynchronous orbit. Otherwise, you would lose your signal every time the satellite went below the horizon. So when an object or 
satellite anything is in geosynchronous orbit, it will stay above the same point on the planet at all times. This is an interesting thing if you're curious. Go to uh, NASA and pull up their 3D, what's called J-Track. Uh, it's actually their satellite tracking system here. So what you can see are all these dots everywhere. And each one of these little dots is a satellite in orbit. Um, as you can see, there's the International Space Station uh, close to the planet. And all these little dots around here are all satellites that are zooming around our planet, okay, all maintaining certain orbits. But you'll notice there's this sort of very large ring way out here, okay, way, way out here. This is the location of geosynchronous orbit. Okay, so this is where satellites are placed in order to maintain a certain geosynchronous orbit. And it's all basically in one location. Okay. Uh, this ring right around here. So all of these will rotate with the Earth. Okay. As the Earth turns, they will always stay above that particular position. Now, for example, here is what's called SatMex. Okay, so that's one of Mexico's geosynchronous satellites. So a lot of countries have their own satellite, you know, because they need coverage for their own country. Uh, here's another important one for those of you who have XM or Sirius Radio. Uh, that's one of the XM Sirius Radio satellites. Again, it maintains this coverage over this part of the world because it will always be there. So you'll always maintain that signal. If it was one of these closer-in satellites here, well, that one's going to orbit the planet multiple times in a day and you would lose the signal every time it went below the horizon. So that's basically the idea of escape velocity and orbital velocity. Escape velocity is the velocity you need in order to break away from a body's gravity, in other words, to go into orbit or to go into deep space. Um, orbital velocity is the speed at which you will orbit a large body, and that's based on, of course, the size of the body you're orbiting, but more importantly, where you are. And once you're at a certain position, you'll maintain that constant velocity, regardless of how big the object actually is. All right, we'll see you next time.